Good morning and welcome to The Breview, the Instagram live podcast where Konama news and culture is shared over the warmth of coffee. Today's guest, Christian Frazier, the Sweets Kendama legend, is joining me to talk through some of his story as well as why design in Kendama manufacturing is so important. Christian, coming from a background of architecture, will bring a really insightful perspective on how Kendama design actually affects Kendama play. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Christian Frazier, he's the one behind the design of the Batch 1 to Batch 2 and even the Batch 0 Kendamas that Sweets has released called the Legend Mod or the Legend Mod series. Now, these are fantastic Kendamas. They revolutionized what Kendama design was and is and continues to be. And so I'm really, really excited to pick his brain on Kendama design in particular. But as we get ready to dive into this week's review, I want to know down in the chat, what are you drinking this morning? I, of course, as always, and never will I ever be drinking anything but this, uh, I am drinking a nice cup of coffee brewed in my AeroPress this morning. Now, what's been really fun for me recently is actually so many of you guys have been DMing me telling me that you've been picking up coffee tools of your own. Some of you have been getting into Chemex, some of you have been getting into AeroPress, and that gets me so excited. I love hearing those stories. I love knowing your recipes. I love knowing what kind of coffee you guys are brewing. If you ever need help, please DM me. I'd love to walk you through how I brew my cup of coffee. I also have done that a few times on some old episodes or old videos on my IGTV. So if you want to know how I brew my AeroPress and you want to brew it like I do it, uh, you can check out, I think it's my birthday stream uh, from uh, like two weeks ago, a week and a half ago. Go check it out. So guys, this week we are diving into a really great conversation here with Christian Frazier. We're going to get him on in a couple moments, but as we do, like I said, I want to know down in the chat what you are drinking this morning. On top of that, I want to remind you that you can actually participate in this conversation today. Christian and I have set aside two times throughout the episode to answer your questions live. These are a great opportunity for you to get your voice heard in these conversations and to ask your favorite players and influencers some key things. So you can do that by putting your questions in the Q&A tool at the bottom. That's that little question mark and drop them in there. If you put them in the chat, we might see them, but they might get missed. So please put them in the Q&A tool and we'll make sure to get to them. And lastly, yo, guys, check out these shirts for Brew Battle. Brew Battle was awesome. Uh, I had a lot of fun there, and I'm really excited about the, the merch that came out of it. We're all sold out. I have a couple left that I'm going to be giving away to some friends and people that helped run the event. Uh, but on top of that, I wanted to know uh, on one of my most recent posts if you'd like to see more Kendama Latte merch. Shout out to Jacob Shire or Kendama.mamba who designed the graphics for the event. Okay. Guys, we're going to dive in here right away. I'm going to add Christian Frazier on here. And let's get this episode kicking. Christian Frazier, i got to find you in here. There he is. Let's get Christian on here and give him a warm welcome. Christian, what up? welcome to the review. Hey, guys. Hey, everyone. What's up, Adam? Happy Saturday. Happy Halloween. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I actually didn't even realize when planning this episode that it would be Halloween on the day that we were doing this. I really should have gotten in a getup, worn a costume or something <laughs> like that. I didn't have that much foresight. <laughs> yeah, Halloween's a little muted this year. You know, it's COVID season, so hopefully people aren't going to too many parties, you know? Yeah. Uh, do you have plans for this evening? Do you know what you're doing? No, I'm just having a couple friends over. It's like I, I went big for Halloween last year. I had like multiple costumes and it was a lot of fun because usually... Halloween's during MKO or NAKO, so I've never yeah. missed it so often. But last last year was sick, so I'm glad I got to do it. Yeah, I honestly always wanted MKO to, to overlap with Halloween, so that way we could have like a, a Halloween costume MKO party, like pre the event or post the event. I think that'd be so fun. I yeah. think someone someone out there should start a Kendama event around Halloween. That's like a costume based event. Hopefully next year, if COVID's not around, we can do that. Yeah, that'd be sick, dude. Love it, dude. Um. I am so geeked on this conversation uh, for a couple reasons. One, because you just released a, a Kendama that was created around and thematically designed around coffee, which Absolutely. I got here around my neck. I am so jazzed Thank on you. this. But more than that, I'm actually really genuinely interested to get your perspective on Kendama design and manufacturing and how Kendama design actually affects our ability to play and progress the game of Kendama. Now, we'll get into that in a little bit, but what I do want to know is a couple things right off the bat, because I always like to kick things off with a few easy questions and get things moving. So, what I want to know, Christian, from you, because I always ask everybody else in the chat, what are you drinking this morning? So, nothing special, just uh, 
used my AeroPress, made some, just a cup of coffee based off, uh, just bought some whatever beans from the store, you know, or just whatever kind of looks good at the time. I'm not too like picky or anything about coffee as long as it's like hot. Uh, black and has mm. caffeine we're we're good you know so i'm yeah and upset. do you typically make do you typically make your own coffee in the morning yeah i usually do an aero press or um my french press just based on like how many how much coffee i'm gonna drink oh yeah yeah and french press obviously if you're gonna be drinking more than one cup aero press yeah, is kind of tedious if you're gonna start making more than one cup in a routine it takes absolutely. a little bit of time yeah the french I get press that. is awesome especially just because you can just drink it like all day you can, you can go for a while i really do need like a normal coffee pot though, you know, like a normal drip coffee. Cause then you can actually yeah. just do it all day. Yeah, you could. Um, have you, have you tried doing a Chemex or anything like that? Like a pour over yet? I haven't. I think the pour over is my next kind of step yeah. into the coffee game. Oh, I love pour over, especially Chemex because it's, I don't know, like the aesthetic of it is really pretty and beautiful and you can get some really cool shots of, of it swirling or whatever you want for just like graphical design and imaging. Yeah. But on top of that, I find making a Chemex incredibly methodical and meditative in the morning. So sometimes I'll just sit there and I'll just like sit there almost like falling asleep while I'm just doing these <laughs> circles and, and it's so refreshing and relaxing. So I love making Chemex. Okay. I want to know, secondly, what is your all time favorite trick in Kendama? It doesn't necessarily have to be one you've done. It could be one that you're maybe eyeing or one that someone else has done, or it could be one that you just find the most satisfying. It's really a very open-ended question. Yeah. I need to get it more narrow. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, I think there's a lot of answers, but I think kind of in the past couple of years, I've realized my favorite trick is, um, the, the name I've called it is Around the Tama, where you do um, Inward Still, Inward Lunar, Inward Axe, Lighthouse, all mm. the way around. It's because back when I first started, like, I remember my friend and I, Joey, when we were learning Kendama, we figured out what stilts was. We're like, oh, I didn't know you could do that. And then once I figured that out, we couldn't land it or anything. But then I realized yeah. all the other stall points. And so back in, like, 2008, I was like, yo, what if you could do all the stalls at once? And that was, like, a dream trick for years and years and years. Yeah. And I finally did it in 2016, I think. One of the, tw the okay. first, the first 28 tricks later, I did it. And it was, like, just, like, my crowning achievement personally. Yeah. So. And now oh, I can wow. do it super easily. So I love it. Yeah. And now we have the Gallagher's who pull that off in like their first five seconds of their freestyle runs. And they're like, ah, this is easy. Yep. Nick went back <laughs> like, and forth right off. Yeah. The oh my gosh. That was amazing. Yeah. Okay. And then lastly, what I want to know before we dive into the real meat of the conversation here today is who is a Kendama player that deeply inspires you? Oh man. There's so many. Um, I've gone through like phases, you know, like, I mean, I've, I've only ever had two favorite Kendama players. The first one was Jeffrey Van Reven, Jeffrey Van Rasta, um, sweet okay. legend um, from, from the Netherlands. Like he, back in the day, like 2008 to maybe like 2015, just so many different edits and tricks that no one, he was doing tricks no one had done before every single time. Um, right. And then kind of after that, it was Ben Harold, of course, as the, tip, as the typical pro says, Ben Harold's your yeah. pro's favorite pro. Um, your pro's favorite. Hon honestly, also, I need to keep a tally. Of, of how many people say Ben Harold when I ask him this question. Yeah, but it's like still, there's so many other players I love. It's like, I love like Stodge tricks. I love the Gallagher's. I love, I mean, my mm. entire team. I love what Sweets does for Kendama. Um, back in the day, like my three favorite players were Roush, Jeffrey, and the Nicholas Schofer from Switzerland. Just like oh. the, leg the legendary European crew, you know? Yeah, yeah. You had some, some big European influence there. Yeah, I mean, back then it's like, in the US, there was a handful of us, but then Europe's, was already kind of like off and running with a lot of yeah cool they were stuff. moving already and that yeah, was absolutely. i did chrome actually start before sweets kendamas i actually don't know i don't i don't believe so chrome okay. first kind of came with their first popular thing was domifest 2013 and sweets kendamas started in 2010 but i'm sure chrome was around okay. at least a year or two before that but sure. i could be i could be wrong someone correct me yeah, uh, we'll we'll have to get another Chromey on here in the future and ask them about the, the history of Chrome and how it got started. Yeah, but okay, I don't even know. Awesome. We're going to dive in here in just a moment. But those of you that are just joining in, if you want to participate in this morning's episode, make sure you drop a question in the Q&A tool. We've set aside some time throughout the episode to ask Christian your questions that you want to ask. And it's a great way for you to get your voice heard in these episodes. Now, all that said, Christian, are you ready to dive into the review? Let's do it. I'm ready. I got my coffee. I got some kendamas just chilling here. I'm not going to play with them, but I'm ready. <laughs> I know. That's the hardest thing during <laughs> these episodes. It's like, uh, I just want to get up and do a trick, but, but here we are. 
<laughs> okay, Christian, here's what I want to know. I always like this question for a couple of reasons. One, that it always brings us way back and it takes us back to the origin point. And I like to ask this question to most of my guests is asking, what was your very first point of contact with Kendama? For sure. So um, my friend Joey, Joey Kapansky, he's the guy that actually directed, shot, and edited the Batch 2 commercial, the 60 second oh, commercial. Um, so he's one of my best friends. So he had it in high school. Um, his friend, um, Chris Smith, is a professional rollerblader. So that's like he had one. Then he showed mm -hmm. his video production class, which included Joey, Jake Kapansky, that's JFK, um, Jubaka, Ryan Ford, of course. Yeah. Um, all right. Showed all of them. And then he came to marching band practice one day, and I was, we were in marching band. And he had it, and I was like, well, that's dumb. Like, what are you doing? Um, then, like, a couple months into it, I tried it, like, once, and then he came over one time, and, like, I borrowed his for the weekend, and, like, I was hooked. I, it's, it's honestly hard to remember what it was like back then, but I, I don't remember my first spike. I don't remember my first, like, big cup or anything. I just yeah. – I have a couple small memories, and, like, at a certain point, I really, like, connected with it because I was finding out how to challenge myself. And I think that's what Kanama was – for me, just a challenge mm -hmm. at all times. So for you, was it actually pretty individual for you or was it a community centric thing? Definitely individual. It's always been individual. It's like even like nowadays, like kind of part of the batch two edit is I talk about how it's really just kind of personal to me. Cause back then, like mm -hmm. Joey and I played together, played Konami together for like a year or so. And then we did the Konami USA entries in 2009. And then mm -hmm. for like two years, I played Konami by myself in my basement like mm. no no other players were around until the georgia scene blew up in like 2011 so kanam has been always been very individual like i i just like to do it kind of in my room like chilling i um filmed in my parents basement for years and years and years just tr learning new tricks and it's always been like mm -hmm. me versus the kendama you know that's all i've always kind of seen it i guess yeah, that's really interesting. So for me, it definitely started out as community. And then it kind of dropped into individual where I just started progressing and trying to learn new tricks and catch up to everybody. And I kind of like zoned in on myself. And I would do it during my college years, just in my room trying to avoid homework or whatever it was. Yep. And then and then more recently, I've kind of actually I feel like I've stepped back out of that where I, I still play by myself, but I don't progress by myself. I actually feel like I've, I've joined into more of a community centric mind now where like I just play because it brings other people together. And now all I want to do is just like use this as a tool to help create conversation, to bring people in, to invite people into this long journey that is just joyful, full of Kaizen, this continuous improvement. And so I, that, that's where I'm at now. So I, I actually find it incredibly fascinating when someone's able to do it individually and keep progressing and keep challenging themselves because I feel like I burn out Did, and you don't feel that I I've always stro strove. I always strive to not <laughs> burn out. I always strive to get better no matter what. Yeah. Um, and somehow I, I mean, I really think I've been able to do that still, which is cool. Especially, I mean, like with batch two, the, the way the Kanama's designed, like it's helped me get better at a certain kind of set of tricks um, this past mm -hmm. year. And like, even just still now I'm still filming tricks and got some things going on. So, I think that's what's kept me in it so long because there's plenty of players I was playing with in 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 that just aren't as deep into it anymore, you know? Yeah. And I mean, everyone's got their own lives and the reasons why they maybe not be as connected with Kendama. But I think it's worked out in my favor just because it was always me versus the Kendama. Um, it's like, I'm mm -hmm. not the guy that like has a Kendama out in public at all times. Like, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll do it in public, but like, I don't always like, hey, well, come look at this or like, really engaging yeah. people it's just really kind of just like my thing you know but obviously at events and with the homies like i'm all about yeah it. i think i'm just yeah. naturally more like introverted and shy where i'd rather just like do my thing interesting that's super cool okay we'll, we'll jump back into a bit of a kendama related conversation in a bit but but you're also pretty well known from the kendama community for what you do outside of kendama which is architecture is correct yes so I want to I want to actually know a bit of that journey and that story. Where where did the, your desire to get into architecture all begin, and and what does that journey look like for you? For sure. Okay. So you got to cut me off if I'm rambling because architecture and design <laughs> is like at this point yeah, it's sure. part of my like being and my existence. It's like yeah. all I think about and do. Um, and so that, I, that's the goal, right? Yeah, for sure. I think some a profession like architecture, you really have to be in love with it, and it has to be your passion. Um, so in high school. I was really lucky. We had architecture engineering classes. Mm. Um, one of my friends was taking like the drafting class and I was like, that looks fun. Let's do that. 
So I took like the first drafting class and like it was cool. The teacher was awesome. I still talk to him every now and then. Then I took like the engineering class and I liked that. Then I finally got into the architecture class where we were modeling stuff in three dimensions in the computer. And mm -hmm. there was the first assignment was like, find a house you like and model it. So I found this mm. house. It's a famous house by one like a really, really famous American architect from the twentieth century. And like when I saw the house, I was like, What? Like you can do that. Buildings look like that. And like that was a just like a switch that flicked. So from there I was just so interested in design and how things were made and like just buildings. And it kind of just brought me to a point where I decided to do it in college. And then once you're kind of in an architecture program in college, it's either like, um, like swim or drown, you know, it's like, you gotta yeah. be deep into it if you're going to survive. And I do have, oh, so I'll, I'll, add, I'll add one more thing. I have learned in the past year. So I sort of played a lot more video games due like due to the pandemic. Yeah. Um, and back in like middle school, I used to, I played Halo a ton. I used yeah. to like model Halo levels um, in the computer and I like put them on my Xbox and play them on PC. And so what I learned is Halo inspired me in a lot of ways to create space and forms and objects and things you can interact with. So it's like a lot of it also is rooted back to my kind of passion for video games as a kid. Yeah, that's super interesting. So I was actually going to ask about that. So growing up, if you were a video game player, which it sounds like you were, did you did you end up leaning towards those games that had like playground modes where you could just build and create things? If so, what were some of those favorite games of yours that you were able to just like play and and build stuff? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the only I really didn't do it as much as you'd think. Like someone like with an archi architecture brain would. It's yeah, I did yeah. it a lot in Halo Three, which had Forge mode, which was sick. You could yeah. Oh, levels. I remember Forge mode like crazy. That was so fun. Yeah, and I did it in like Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, just building your own skate okay. parks and stuff. Yeah. But but also I was like big into Legos and stuff, and actually yeah 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 like, putting stuff together for sure. So cool. So you did you ever get into the whole like Minecraft or anything like that building? I didn't, and it's like I'm sure I'd enjoy it, but I know I know Minecraft's one of those games like Fortnite where it's so popular. And it's so popular because it's such a good game because people can get so deep into it. And yeah. at this point in my life, I'm like, I don't need that. I don't need a video <laughs> game where I'm getting sucked in. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I there's feel other that. stuff going on. I feel that people are like, don't you want to try something new? You've been playing Konama for so long. And I'm like, no, I don't. I've committed so much to this. I just don't think I can commit that much to another thing right now. Dude, exactly. So, I know that feeling. Uh, I sometimes like wish I didn't play Konama so I could have time for other hobbies. Yeah. Like, uh, like guess, reading or something. I don't know. It sounds yeah, fun. Yeah, for sure. But I always get pulled right back to this, this ball in a cup and I, and I'm just sitting there for hours playing and I'm like, I probably could have done something else, but I was having too much fun. Yeah. It's all good. And that's what, that's what it's all about, you know? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. I want to know then you're now, you're finished your, your college, you're graduated, you're actually working now, you're doing architecture. What has that been like? What are some projects that have gotten you excited? What are, what are ways that, that you have seen architecture change and evolve that we should be aware of as Konama players or just as other people? That's a tough question. Uh, architecture is, I don't know. It's like the weirdest thing. Cause one, it's the simplest thing in this way where he's like, Oh, it's a building. Because we're all familiar with buildings. We're all probably mm -hmm. buildings right this second. You're in a house. You're wherever you are. Um, so it's just space. And it's like something you occup occupy and live in. Um, and in terms of like architecture and design and how it's evolving, it's like the biggest thing now, I would say, is just sustainability and learning how a building can um, be a, a less negative impact on the environment, you know, between um, yeah. construction and the way a building operates and is maintained over time and learning about materials and what's good for the environment, what's bad for the environment. And that's, that's a whole, that's just like one part of kind of the architecture in general, but it's like setting the new meta for like design. It's like, if your building is not sustainable in some ways, like, what are you doing? You know, it's like, mm -hmm. we gotta be looking forward as much as possible. Yeah. So, so then take me into to what you're doing here now today. Are you, what kind of architecture work are you doing? Are you working corporate? Are you working home building? What kind of stuff do you do? Yeah. So I work for a firm called Perkins and Will. It's a really, really big global firm. We have like 26 offices across the world. Um, so our office in Atlanta, um, our office itself, we have like 160 people and do a bunch of different market sectors, but it's all corporate um, for the most part or not corporate. It's all commercial for the most part, yeah. no residential. I work in K-12 education, so I do oh. um, schools for Whoa. K-12, K you know? Um, so I love doing that. I did my thesis on in college 
on K-12 education because the way I looked at it, um, there's two places in your life you spend the most time growing up. It's your house and it's the school you go to, you know, for yeah. the first like 18 years of your life, that's it. So I just, yeah. I realized like how powerful a school can be for someone's upbringing and the way they learn and the way they learn to socialize and just like everything. So I found a lot of interest in that, learned about how schools were designed over the past like 200 years in the U.S. Um, so that's what I do now. Um, I have, I just finished a project recently where it was a cafeteria addition onto this existing campus in downtown Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, so that's like built. So that was pretty cool to actually design a building and get it built. Um, and right now yeah. I'm working on wow. an elementary school in also in Atlanta and I'm working on a middle school gym and other stuff building in Auburn, Alabama. So, wow, that is, that's so cool. And, and I think that actually is going to tie in a little bit to our conversation uh, about your Kendama designs and with the batch zero to batch two mods is that design actually is more than just making something look pretty. It's, oh, yeah. it's actually, it's actually impactful to the way that things operate, the way that people feel in those buildings that, that you were really hitting on that with that K to 12. It's that you chose to want to do that because it actually plays a part in the development of those kids that are in school. It's more than just building a building. Okay. There's actually an emotional and a, and a developmental part to that. Do you want to hit on that a little bit and walk me through what sort of design features play effect on, on our lives, like in a school? Yeah, dude, absolutely. So to put it simply, the way I look at architecture is the combination of art and science, like right there. It's the perfect medium between the two. And a lot of people think architects do a lot of science and like, oh, is the building going to stand up and yeah. stuff like that. But that's not what it's about. If I design a building, I have a structural engineer that's hired as my consultant. So like, oh, I like lay out the building and where everything needs to go and they'll help me to get the columns and the beams everywhere so the building stands up. What I'm focused on is space. How do you create an inviting space and the size of it and like where, where are windows and um, how much natural light gets in and what are the materials mm -hmm. being used and how is the lighting laid out and where's the mechanical stuff? Like, is it hidden or is it mm -hmm. exposed? Um, and how does it connect with other spaces in the building? It's really this like, it's, God, it's just architecture is just a lot. It's this multi-layered process that starts with one life safety. Um, these buildings, ultimately, yeah. there's a fire. You need to be able to get out in time yeah. and you need to make sure um, the way the building is built and like sprinklers and what's in the walls and stuff can keep you safe. So that's like number one. From there, it's just about how you can create spaces with good daylight. How do you create spaces that feel comfortable? How do you create space that um, is good for education or something? It might be good for a gathering space. It's really just, there's a lot. It's a lot, dude. I, like I said, I yeah. can just keep, keep going and going and going. Oh man, I, I wish we could. We, we, Instagram gives us one hour, so we can only, we can only talk so much about things. Oh, that is so cool, though. I, I think that that's really fascinating. And especially when you begin to realize the, the role that architecture plays. Now, I think uh, I had posted on my story, like a walkthrough of the Calgary Library just recently oh. that I was in. And you commented on that. Yeah, and, and that beautiful building, building. Yeah. So if you guys in the chat and those of you tuning in afterwards, look up the Calgary Public Library that was recently built, I think, two or three years ago in downtown Calgary. Now, that this thing is utterly fascinating it's it's an architectural piece of magnificence the yeah. whole building itself is really beautiful people travel all around the world to come visit this building to go and take photos in it because of how it's built now that that's impactful but more than that that building actually stimulates an emotion in you that yeah. helps you to learn helps you to cultivate creativity that people book rooms in there for business meetings so that way they can get more creative so architecture actually plays such a pivotal role in in people's lives as more than just a building that lifts people up and I think that that's so cool. And, and that actually will bring us into our conversation here in a couple minutes. But what I want to do before we get into the design of the, the batch mods, uh, I want to talk uh, through some Q and A's. We got a ton of questions that have come in through the chat and a few that were submitted yep. beforehand. So let's try and hit up a couple of these uh, before we, we run out of time today. Absolutely. Okay. Um, before we get too far off the coffee track, Kendama Cares actually put in a question uh, last minute this morning asking, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, the batch two mod is themed after the first cup of coffee in the morning, but she wants to know, Kanama Cares wants to know, uh, what do you call your first cup of coffee in the morning? Do you call it a cup of joe, a cup of coffee, <laughs> java, mud dirt, bean juice, Americana, morning brew, gave a long list of different names. Do you have a name that you call your coffee? I don't specifically, but the first thing that came to my mind right now is just life. 
you know <laughs> that, it's that first cup of coffee that's just like it just gets you going you know like i especially on the weekends i love waking up early because like i hate waking up early for work but i love waking up early when i don't have to work so i'll yes. wake up early and just like sit on the couch and like watch netflix or play xbox and just drink that first cup of coffee and it's just like you go from like two different totally two totally different states of mind like really quick you know yeah oh yeah oh believe me i wake up so groggy in the morning i go down I like lean on my arrow press because I'm still so <laughs> tired and then it's done and I take a couple of sips and next thing I know I'm ready to do a brew view. <laughs> exactly. All right. New underscore lace asked creamer or nah? Never black coffee every single time, always until black. I'm dead. Like don't put yeah. that crap in my coffee dog. Like no black coffee gang. I yeah. love it. Okay. Uh, Jubaka asked, uh, this is Ryan asking, is it true uh, that Lily is a better <laughs> Kanama player than you? <laughs> That's the story she tells. And who is um, Lily? Lily's my girlfriend. Awesome. She's the lovely, like, she's amazing. She's she's my queen. Um, uh, she, Lily will tell you she's a better Kanama player than me, but I think she needs to show the concrete evidence first, you know? So that's a, that's a Dama dare for Lily. I know you're in the, I know you're in the chat. Mm. Okay, <laughs> we got one here from Epic underscore Palm Tree. What does me against the Dama look like? Uh, do you have a constant trick to do list? Yeah, so I'm not like Ben Harold where he has like the, the notebook full of tons of stuff, but I have just notes in my phone of like, like we got these new Sweets Kanamas like yesterday for they're releasing soon. Like, hey, go make a little edit. So it's like mm -hmm. I went ahead and made a list of tricks I want to film for that video. And I have lists of tricks like that that go on like forever, like back from years and years ago. And I'll, sometimes I'll just flip through them and I like, pick, oh yeah, this idea and like this trick. And now that I was trying to do it then, maybe this time since it's five years later, I can do it a lot in a, a way harder version of it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, I mean, and it's also just like watching what is happening with Kendama tricks in general. You know, I'm always just trying to keep up. Yeah. Obviously, obviously Fringe Case kind of changed the game um, this year on how oh, yeah. Kendama tricks are done. And I'm, I can't do most of the stuff I've been doing, but there's these little pieces I can pick that I really like kind of mm -hmm. hone into and kind of make it my own. So I think it's always just about seeing what's new, um, getting a part of that, but also finding new things that I can do on my own. Cool. Uh, Cody Grizz asked, how big is the <laughs> Fraser stash going to grow? That is a good question. Right now we're pretty substantial. It's like if, <laughs> when, I sh when I shaved it at the beginning of the year, which I guess was the first misstep of 2020, um, Things went astray real quick this year. Um, it looked pretty rough back then, but right now I think we're pretty solid. So we'll see. Uh, the better question is, Cody, how long is the hair going to go? Because this is, this is getting crazy for me personally. Mm. Okay, I got a, an interesting question here from Crustlord420. This one actually is really unique. I've never heard <laughs> this question asked before. I know you probably get a lot of free kendamas from sweets, but what was the last kendama you actually purchased? I'll show you because I got them today. Oh, awesome. <laughs> I got the Jacob Lowe and the Damon Kershire mod, bruh. Yo, Sick. shout out to Grain Theory. Shout out to Jacob Lowe and Damon. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Those mods are beautiful. No, I, I definitely, out of any Konama company that actually buy Konamas from, Grain Theory is the number one for sure. I have a GT2. I have like a Stod mod. I have stuff from their older Konamas. So love Grain Theory. Love you, Jake Wings and, and everyone else associated with it. Awesome. Okay, we're going to ask maybe one or two more questions here, and then we'll jump into the conversation about Kendama design. And I have a whole stack of Kendamas next to me that I can't wait to show you. So we'll get there in just a moment. But a uh, great question here from Nick Gallagher, 42. Uh, he asks, what are the biggest disadvantages you can find playing a right-handed Kendama, even though you're left-handed? That is a great question, Nick. And I'd be, I want to ask you the same thing. I'll just text you some other time. There's two things. One, uh, gunslingers. I'm horrible at them. I can do them enough to, to call myself a pro. But um, I gunslinger on the big cup. And a lot of kendamas are better designed when the gunslinger is done on the small. Under the small. So that's tough. And the other thing is juggling. Um, I was, when we were learning to juggle in like 2011, 2012, like no one was doing it right. You know, I was trying to figure it out. So when I juggle normally, uh, say I, I go an airplane. If I do an airplane, the big cup faces me. So then the string right. is on the right. And so when I'm juggling, okay. I, it's just like the string gets all caught up in, in all that stuff. So I, I so, have a big, I'm horrible at juggling because I think I learned it wrong. And also my strings on the wrong side. Right. So do you, you actually play your kendamas still strung up as a right-handed kendama or do you restring them now? 
No, no, there. It's always been a right-handed kendama. Um, when I first started, I didn't know you could switch it, and I was like, Whoa. I was like four or five months in, and I could already do a lunar. And then I figured out you could switch it, so I switched it on a kendama. But then I couldn't do a lunar, so I said, "Screw that, we're going back to normal." Whoa, that's really interesting. So you you still play with a right-handed kendama, even though you're left-handed. So you had to learn how to do everything kind of backwards or the opposite way. Kind of. I mean, Nick Gallagher does the same thing, and he's a champ. So I mean, it's, it's not like it's a, a big deal or anything. I mean, so if, what, if anything, what, what... <laughs> go ahead. I was going to say, what you're saying is us right-handed folks should actually string our kendamas lefty and then use them that so. way, and maybe we'll become champs. Maybe that's it. Or just be a Gallagher. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess when I do, like, pull up anything, like stall tricks, I, I can turn it both ways, like, just as easily. Um, so I don't know. It's really, it's weird. I don't know which tricks I've learned that have been either an advantage or disadvantage, besides kind of, like, juggling, I think. Yeah, no, that's so interesting. I, I've never actually realized that either that Nick plays that way or that you played that way. That's actually so so unique and I had no idea. So that's a really cool learn for me. Some Absolutely. some Kendama homework. Gonna have to go back through all your old videos and, and realize what you're doing is different. That's yep. so cool. Okay, uh, let's jump into the meat of the conversation here and we'll save some of those questions for the end. There's a ton in there, so we'll have lots of content to get through. But what I want to know now is actually what the journey looked like from you becoming a pro to you designing your kendamas and journeying through that process. Because throughout that process, you were also going through the process of becoming a, an architect. You were in college when you first were sponsored. Is that correct? Yes, I was sponsored by Sweets. It's a, it's a, the 10 year anniversary is right yeah. around the corner, which is crazy. Um, I was a freshman in college when I was sponsored by Sweets. Um, and by the time I had graduated, it was 2015. So it was kind of around the F3 tour. That was right after I graduated. So we were working on F3s and, and other things. Um, so there was, I mean, it was a lot, I guess. Do you want me to start from like the beginning with like my pro model journey? Or like, where yeah, are we going it, here? Yeah, catch, catch us up a little bit in a, in a succinct format. And then we'll, we'll dive more into the batch series more recently. I have, I have one of your original pro mods here. Nice. I got the, the old sticky clear on the... Uh, I don't was this your second mod I can't remember this is on the prime shape that's the third one this is the third okay so there were yeah. two before that maybe yeah. walk us through the journey of each kendama and then lead us towards where we're at today yeah for sure um so the first one was the gold to white to natty fade um mm. those were released in 2012 me Willie P Wase Chaz Edwards and Willem Smith Clark if anyone knows that name um we all had pro models then so that one, we had frost paint at the time. So I wanted to do like a golden white, always loved those colors, and then natty on the bottom. So it's like it was a painted kanama, but it played like a natty. Ooh, it's unique. Right. That's kind of my thought process back then. But in retrospect, I don't, I don't love that kanama. But it's, there's, some, <laughs> there's a lot of sentimental value to it. Then the sure. second one in 2014, where the Sweets team, we had all, we had six plus the two legends. Um, the sparkly ones, the solid color of the sparkles. So mine was maroon. Maroon is my favorite color. Still is, right. always will be. So I just wanted a sparkly maroon kendama. So that one was sick with the totems on them. I had the little hexagon cube, nine square grid thing. There's a whole okay. story about that. And then in 2017, we did the um, F3 Pro models with the two color fade and the 30% solid on the bottom. That was inspired by um, the kendama Max used at World Cup in 2015. Yep. These ones, right? Yep. And so there were the F3 ones and cushion. Then we did the ones out of China, which were prime, sticky. And then we did the cushion ones as well. And then to get into the legend models, it all started, there was a, whenever Max and I talk, Max Norcross, our conversations are like an hour long at least. So I couldn't tell you what we all talked about, but sometime in 2017, I believe we had a phone call. We we're talking about new pro models and what we wanted to do. And somehow we landed on this idea like, oh, I'm Christian's going to be playing for 10 years soon. Let's make a 10 year anniversary kendama and like max and i kind of like at the same time we're like whoa that's a cool idea so in 20 at 2017 mko um i was sat down with paulson matt paulson one of the graphic designers who does all the mm -hmm. patch kendamas with me i said paulson i want to release a new pro model a year from now at mko 2018 um with all these cool ideas and he said let's mm -hmm. get started because kendama pro models take like at least a year if anyone's if any other pros know the process, it takes far too long. A long time. Yeah. So then at MKO 2018, which is two years ago now, we released Batch Zero. I get, so before, before we actually go further, 
I, if, if you haven't tuned in to previous episodes of the review, I think I don't, I was trying to remember which episode I said this on, but I had made a statement that I'm on this quest to collect all 50 of the batch zeros uh, that were originally <laughs> released. It's impossible. It, yeah. I have like five of them. So, so here, here's where I'm at right now. I actually purchased one at MKO 2018. So I have mine right here. And and you actually had signed it at some point on that weekend. And so you signed it here. And then next year, I actually came back and I brought it and I got you to sign it on the other cup. So I have two I years worth of, worth of signatures on here from you to keep it legendary. Now, secondly, I had ordered a box of Kendamas from Jacob Treble when he was trying to get rid of a ton of his stock. And inside there, in one of the boxes, he was getting rid of a, a batch of zero. And I was like, why are you doing that? Now, anyways... Uh, it slipped in there and I ended up getting a second batch of zero. And so then that's when it sparked the journey. I was like, I wonder how many of these I can collect. So then uh, just recently, my buddy, uh, uh, his name's Sean, he came out for brew battle uh, last weekend and he's like, happy birthday, passes me a, a craft bag. And he's like, open it up. And I was like, you got me a craft kingdom. And he's like, it's not a craft. And, uh, and I open it up and it's a third batch of zero. So I wow, have, dude, that's crazy. I have three out of the 50 batch of zeros that were released at MKO 2018. And now I'm on the quest to, to collect 47 more. <laughs> that's insane. I'm going to call a timeout real quick. My AirPods are dying. Yep, for sure. Take a quick minute here. So guys, well, he is switching over his headphones. Uh, if you want to ask a question for Christian Frazier, we've set aside some time at the end of this conversation uh, to ask your questions. Put them down in the Q&A tool at the bottom. That's that question mark. All right. Cool. So can you hear me? Yeah, I'm good. Perfect. So I have three batch zeros and I've gone ahead and purchased uh, one of the, the batch ones. So one, they were not batch zeros as well because I wanted a new one. And I also wanted the new Tama because... Actually, there were some issues with the original batch of zero. Uh, and I'm really curious to, to chat with you about, about that design process towards where we're at now. Because when the batch of zeros were released, a lot of them ended up getting this issue because the grain was laid the wrong way or yep. sideways. And so they would start to chip and they, were, they become flat like this instead of curved. Yep. So the whole thing with this, so the wood design came uh, before the paint design. Like this, this Tama was going to look like a bunch of different things, but the wood was always there. Um, so the ones that were released at MKO 2018, um, first off, the batch zero wasn't even supposed to be on the cup. I told, we told China not to do it, but they did it anyways. And in retrospect, <laughs> it, it worked out because it's cool to actually have one that says batch yeah. zero. Um, so yeah, so the, the Tamas, they were all horizontally plied and no, that's not good for a bevel at all. And I was like, this Kanama does not work unless you have vertical grain. So mm -hmm. I, I honestly forget like the conversations at the time, but we pretty much had to rush, get a bunch of these to the shop for MKO. And these, the best part about batch zero is these were painted in house in sweets, kendamas. Like they taped the whole off. Thing. He, yeah. They taped this off so you could get the white. It's like, you can even see this one's like not perfectly aligned or anything. Oh, and like interesting. The cushion and the translucent whiskey is just like, it's just sweets paint is just better than like any paint ever. You know, it's like this, this is a batch one, like sticky from China. It's beautiful. But like something about Sweets paint just always yeah. hit harder, you know? So that's why there's such a limited amount because they can only paint so many in time. And also we, did, we didn't have that many in house, um, but also getting the time to figure out how to get the grain vertical took, took a while afterwards because batch one didn't fully release till six months after batch zero, which is like far too long. Yeah. But thankfully kind of that time in between in the limited, um, stock of these kind of hyped up the Kanama a lot more and kind of was kind of part of this perfect concoction of things that happened to make the batch one decade mod so popular. Yeah. And, and I think, and I don't know if it'd be a stretch for me to say this. I think it's probably one of the most recognizable or most popular Kanamas to have been released in the past couple of years in terms of like how many re-releases of it have gone on. I don't know how many are out there, but it's arguably probably one of the most infamous Kanamas of the past five to 10 years. Yeah, I mean, and maybe maybe you'd have more insight there. No, dude. I mean, I agree. I am. Um, like, it's really cool to hear that from you. And like the past couple of years, I've really felt the love from the entire Kanam community on how much they enjoy the Kanam and um, kind of what it means to a lot of people. So I'm like, first off, just incredibly hum humbled that this Kanam um, was so successful, and it it was just an amazing feeling. Like after I, because I had three pro models before that, and the tough part about pro models is there's always 
your teammates have the same pro models, different colors. And mine was never yeah. the most popular. It's like the first, the very first ones, Willie's was easily the most popular. The sparkly ones, Willie's was also the most popular. Then Max and Sweets were kind of right after him. And then the third round, uh, Max and Cooper were deep into their Sweets life kind of journey. Yeah. And so theirs were super popular. So it really felt like amazing after like 10 years to finally yeah. have that Kanama that was like, you know, your time had come. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, I did not expect it to kind of go as well as it did. Like, I just knew I want to make a cool Kanama that's different, that's pushing kind of the boundaries of what Kanama design is and see what happens. And it just, it worked. So yeah. thanks everyone. And so, yeah, no, <laughs> and to thank you, this Kanama was so inspiring to, I think a lot of people, a lot of people actually that, that day at MKO when it was released, switched out their regular Dama and started competing with the Batch Zero for MKO that year, which I thought was really fascinating. And now that's become sort of a, a regular thing. I think last year I saw so many, so many people competing with the Liam mod when it was released. Like oh, people yeah. just show up, buy a Kendama and compete with it and rock it. And I it's become it. a normal thing, which is so cool. Okay, so take me a little bit through the journey then from batch zero to batch one. And now most recently, the batch two mod where yes. you're actually exercising some of your architectural background, your design background to create kendamas that are designed for specific types of play. Uh, walk me through some of that journey. Yeah, so it, so batch zero, we did it, it was great. And then kind of between batch zero and batch one, I was like, man, like, what if, what if there was more to this project? What if it was like, what if I did another color of this? Or what if I changed this piece and made a play a little bit differently? And so during that same time, I really got into sneakers. So I'm like a sneaker head now, like my closet's full of sneakers. And I was looking at how sneakers were designed and Michael Jordan's kind of journey with the Jordans and from the Jordan one, the Jordan two, the Jordan three, they're all very mm -hmm. different. They all do different things. And they also have a million colorways of each of them. So I was like, mm -hmm. whoa, 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 whoa. First off, I'm not Michael Jordan. I wish I was the Michael Jordan. <laughs> that's probably, that's probably bonds, I would say. Um, so I was like, but what if I could recreate what, they did with his sneakers kind of with kendama so the batch one it's like yeah. it's become the most kind of one of the most iconic kendamas like out there if you look at shoes mm -hmm. the jordan one is the same way the jordan one is one of the most iconic shoes of all time um so i was like cool like i'm gonna rock that but then like what's next and so batch one was great it was great for lunars um the tom was pretty light and the ended up pretty heavy so i was like okay it plays a lot of plays well for these reasons but what if i just totally try it the other way, flip it around, made the Tom yeah. heavier, got rid of the base cup hole, got lighter wooden Serato and made it better for the tricks that I'm trying to learn now. It's like, I want to get better at late can flips and gunslingers and taps mm -hmm. and juggles. So that's kind of where my, my effort went. And so batch two became the, the next step in the long, hopefully long journey and kind of lineage of Kendamas. You know, it's like, there will be a batch three, it's, I guess the first time I'm saying it publicly, but it, it will be yeah. out there. I get one day. Um, I don't know what it'll be, but it's going to, it's going to be real, you know, and making these Kendamas one, it just keeps me engaged in Kendama, which I just I'm really fortunate to be able to still make Kendamas and people buy them and Sweets Kendamas mm -hmm. keeps supporting me. Um, but I just really am ready to kind of just keep pushing it. You know, Kendama is still very young and Kendamas are getting bigger and better and all these great features. And I just want to, I'm, I'm really interested in that part of it. And I want to kind of keep pushing it as, as far as I can. Mm -hmm. So the batch mods have kind of stood alone as their own series of kendamas outside of what Sweets is doing with a lot of their others. Now, what we did see was that the batch one slash batch zero ended up becoming the normal shape design for the boost kendama going forward. That was the first kind of release of the boost shape in, in some regard. Yes. Now, are we... Are we going to see that take place across more of the Kendamas where we're going to see more of these strips in more Sweets Kendamas? Or is the batch mods always going to be unique from everything else that's happening at Sweets? The, well, there's Kendamas coming out soon, <laughs> Sweets Kendamas that I think people that love the Decade mod will love a lot. Uh, stay tuned uh, next week. Um, you hear okay. heard it here first. Um, the Turn on those mod, post notifications. Yeah, the Decade mod is kind of, I think the Batch one was the right thing at the right time. And batch two is a compliment to that. And I will right. say this. It's like, people are like, it's just funny. I like, I like reading Instagram comments. People are like, man, I like batch one better. It's like, yo, so do I, you know, everyone likes batch mm -hmm. one better. You can't be like a classic, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So with batch one and batch two, I think this, the story has been told between like these two Kendamas, you know, it's like, this was the start. This was the finish. So like batch right. three, I don't know what it's going to be, you know? 
I know Swiss Canamas is introducing some products that kind of uh, are in the similar, uh, same vein as the decade models. But like batch three, it's like, who knows what it could be? Like, is it going to have different woods? Yeah, probably. But are the woods going to be featured? Maybe. Are the woods going to be used in ways that haven't been used before? Like, maybe, you know? Um, I think it's just an evolving thing. And the decade mod, I think, is always going to stay true and ahead of its time. Because um, mm. Kendama is like, this This is a sick Kendama, you know, with the engravings down here. And mm -hmm. it's what what Damon's doing with like the big cup and stuff like that's yeah. kind of the standard now. So it's like, I can't be yeah. in here designing stuff. That's going to be like out of date really soon. So I just kind of yeah. gotta, I you gotta I be my, thinking ahead. Yeah. And that's kind of what the first one was all about, you know, and now it's kind of normal. And I hope more Kanama companies do more stuff with wood. I, I wish there was more out there, you know? Yeah. Now, now maybe, maybe that's partly because I, I don't imagine it's that easy for a new company to jump into creating something quite like this right off the bat. I, I think what we often see when new companies start up is that it's a pretty basic Kendama. They might have a 70-30 split with a little bit onto it. Now, I don't know what the cost or the type of manufacturing details needed to create something like this go into, but, but I think there's that. But then I did want to uh, ask you in particular, what makes this one unique from, from the batch one? And one thing that stood out to me was that uh, there's actually this texturized engraving near the bevel, and I wanted to pick around at that. Where did that come in and what was that process like? Yeah, so this was like, this is what it was all about to me, the engraving. I was like, I always thought it'd be so cool to have something on the Kendama to help you better track the hole. And I like kind of, I was making coffee at work all the time. And then I started looking at the coffee that I was like, and I was making all these bubbles. And I was like, well, what if, what if that was it? It just kind of just like clicked one day. And I have like older prototypes where it doesn't look like this. It kind of looks horrible. And so this is kind of the version where it turned out where it's like, it's a cool texture. It doesn't interrupt kind of the way you're balancing anything. Yeah. It doesn't like hit your stall points, like with the, the bevel or anything. So it was yeah. just this, just enough to kind of enhance the play to make, um, to make juggling and whatnot just a little easier and a little kind of more, I guess, fine tuned while you're playing. Yeah. Uh, that That's so cool. So maybe, if you have an idea or if you can tease some direction, I'd love to know what some potential inspiration points are, are there for you for batch three. Do you want to keep it uh, drink themed going forward or are we going to start to see, <laughs> are we going to start to see other, other sorts of design play coming into it? Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I won't do any more liquids for batch three because I, I got the two liquids already. Um, I, I mean, I, I really am still like, just starting to kind of conceptualize in my head and I have some notes and some things like written down. I mean, all I know, really know right now, and this could totally change, is it's, it's going to be hopefully very art inspired. Um, mm. And it's, it's specifically a certain movement in art. I won't say what it is, but it's one of the movements in art from the 20th century. That's I, something I really love and connect with. And I think a lot of other people do too. But like, that's all mm. I got. Like, it's literally just like, like, I'm not in a hurry, you know? It's like, yeah. batch one, like, took a long time, and batch two took, like, a year and a half. It's like, when you are trying to make this product, especially with, like, my brain, where everything's got to be perfect, dude. Every, every mm -hmm. little detail matters. Um, well, and that so probably it, comes from architecture, right? If, yeah. if it's not perfect, it's a danger. Yeah, it's, it has to. I mean, it's like, when, thing, when you're doing drawings and things have to get built, you have to think about, okay, who's the guy that's putting these studs down, and how am I going to draw this detail to know where this stud goes in relation to the brick and how you get the drywall and make sure the flashing goes up the wall and everything you got to be paying attention to. Um, so it's, whenever it comes, it's going to come naturally um, just through inspiration and working with um, Sweet Kinamas and Matt Paulson and kind of going from there. So it's, that's all I got right now. I have a lot of, I have good ideas, but nothing is real and nothing will be for a while. Cool. Well, we have a ton of questions in here. Some of them have actually already been answered through the conversation. Uh, so I want to dive into some of these. But before we do, I want to say a huge thank you, Christian, for a couple of things. One, uh, you made a, a kendama that is themed after everything I love. Uh, and so <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, I'm a big fan of the batch two. I love the coffee theme. I love the froth. I love the engraving. I love that it's able, it's been able to help me unlock some tricks for taps, slings, awesome. jugs. So it's been impactful for me. So guys, if you don't have one, I definitely recommend you check it out. Uh, consider buying one. Uh, buy the collection. Start collecting like me. And if you have any badge zero, send them my way. Um, 
Secondly, uh, thank you for what you've done for Kendama throughout the 10 years that you've played. I think that we, we as players, especially for players like myself that have only been playing for maybe five years or less, uh, we owe a huge thank you to the people that have come before us who have progressed this game, who have helped bring it to where it is. And so for me, from the followers and from my fans here, uh, we say a thank you to you as well. I really appreciate it, dude. That's super, super nice. And at the same time, I am constantly inspired by players that are just starting and learning, you know? It's like they're the ones that are going to push the future and continue to innovate. I'm just going to kind of be there to learn from it. So it goes both ways. So I appreciate it. Cool. All right. I got a lot of questions in here. So let's try and hit up a couple of them. We got about 10 minutes left here and then we'll wrap up with the last couple. So here's a question from Epic underscore Palm Tree. He asks you, what does Kendama look like for you at this point? I.e. challenge, stress relief. What does Kendama mean? Yeah, so it's, it's really both. You kind of nailed it. It is a challenge, um, but also stress relief. Since I work from home um, in this room every, every day, and I've been working from home for like seven months, um, it's like I'm back in my studio in college, where in college I'd be up till 3, 4 a.m., like drawing for 20 minutes, playing Kanama for two minutes, drawing for an hour, playing Kanama for five minutes. So it was that thing that just kept me going and kept me kind of focused by not, by getting away from the actual work. Um, but also it's still a challenge. Like I'm just trying to learn new tricks all the time because that's what that's what i like to do mm. that's awesome okay we got a question here from little cloud girl uh <laughs> what's your advice for people that get discouraged about not being able to land tricks easily that's probably a question that i think a lot of pros should be asked uh, because it's not easy kendama is not easy yeah for sure i mean it's it's a hard thing because kendama taught me a lot of perseverance and like dedication and patience um like every pro out there has spent hours and hours and hours and hours trying to do tricks. You know, it's like I posted the thing the other day of me missing the hook, juggle hook over a three day period over multi hour film sessions. Like it's just, you got to put in the time and ultimately you got to understand the feeling when you land it, that's what you're chasing. And you got to like, remember what that feels like. And once you get it, it's like euphoria, you know? And mm -hmm. so you, it's just like chasing that feeling. It's unfortunately like an addiction. Like, yeah, it's like you're but, chasing but a good, a good one. Yeah, yeah, chasing the dragon. I like oh, that. I, hope, I like I that mentality. That cloud girl. That's awesome. Okay, uh, dpats underscore forty eight asked ahead of time on the post, which is the best way to get your questions in. Uh, asked how many different wood, wood types did you test before deciding on what you you used for either the batch one or the batch two? Because you obviously played around a lot with different wood types. Uh, how much did you go through? Yeah, so we didn't go through a ton just based on how limited in, in, in time and what I mean it takes to make this stuff. Um, I, I don't want to say the wood in case I use it again. I don't want other people to to, mm -hmm. to use it right now. Um, the batch batch one, there was a point where the Wenge in both these was a different wood, um, but this one looked better and played better. I also had, because I was doing this all without paint at first, I also had this Tama that didn't have the walnut on top, so it was just beach cherry wenge cherry which was really it looks really sick and i still have the tamas but they were just too light because there's too mm. much cherry yeah cherry's um, so light yeah and i think that's it i think that's it and in batch two i i just knew automatically i was um putting the wenge stripe making it thicker than switching to walnut um i didn't really have any other thoughts but like when mm. we very first started working on it um paulson was in china and i like, had they had the software up that told you kind of woods that they had and kind of how they going you know, to distribute weight in different ways. So we went through a lot like on the computer, but in reality, only like three or four. Super interesting. Okay. I actually have a personal question. Uh, not one that's coming from the comments or the chat here. Uh, I want to know, is there a company out there that you, that you're really you stoked on right now in the way that they're using wood types and Kanam design to affect play? Is there a company that we should keep our eyes on outside of sweets Kanamas that's doing good work there? Right. So honestly, I don't have a good answer for you based on like what other companies are using woods in cool ways. Cause I honestly, I don't follow every single company. I don't, I'm not sure. tuned in to all of it. Um, I have a lot of respect for what grain theory is doing with all their different shapes. Cause I think that is an important part of it. And they're, I guess we'll call it a more boutique kind of kingdom in a way since they're mm -hmm. a lot higher quality. Um, so they have the opportunity to do that. So I think those things are really um, beneficial. Um, to mm -hmm. kind of add that kind of piece in the consumer market. Um, yeah, I wish I had a better answer in terms of what other companies are using wood. I guess I just haven't totally seen them all. And if they're out there, someone let me know. 
Yeah, maybe I'll get your opinion on, on this one for a second, because I think that uh, what Quill has done with one of their kendamas, I can't remember what this one's called, the XYZ or something like that, if you I haven't think, seen this. I think but, I've seen this. Yeah, what they did was they actually like sliced and spliced a piece of Zebrano into the cups to like turn it into a lunar kendama without having to take weight out of their base cup. So they added weight to their Serato in a unique way, which I thought was a, a really cool approach that was yes. unique. I, I'm just curious what, what you think of that. No, we have talked about that same idea in a slightly different way, Paulson and I. And so that's cool. Um, I honestly need to be more tuned into it because, I mean, that that makes perfect sense. It's you can get you can get this weight you want in the big cup without visually totally to kind of making the Serato look different. So that's cool. That's, that's yeah. awesome. I, I love to see that stuff. Cool. Um, all right. We got a couple more in here. All right. Let's see what a few last good questions could be. Um, we didn't talk too much about this, but maybe tell us uh, real quickly in the last couple minutes, how did you and Sweets get connected as far as your journey with Sweets Kendamas? <laughs> what was your first point of contact with, with Matt or with the company? <laughs> so on my 10 year anniversary with Sweets Kendamas, which is coming up soon, I'm gonna post the correspondence that Matt and I had the first time we ever spoke. I'll give you, you have that? Yeah, yeah, because I, I had to save the emails. So uh, it's really simple. I was in my studio, I was 18 years old, um, on like Facebook. I stumbled upon Chaz Edwards, like Sweets Legend, um, Facebook, and I saw Matt Jorgensen had posted a link, like, yo, check out the website, like, I got your picture up there. And I was like, oh, what's that? So I clicked on it, and I saw SweetsKanamas.com, and I like, saw their Kanamas, they looked pretty cool, and they were looking for team members. They wanted people to sponsor. So literally, I sent, I emailed Matt, said, hi, my name's Christian Fraser, I'm from Atlanta. Here's my latest video. It was my Kendama Edit 6. Um, it's somewhere out there on the internet. And within an hour, I was on Sweet Kendamas. And like that was it. It was that simple. Um, mm. So I was in the right place at the right time. It's not like I had to like grind for my spot besides the time I put in like just playing Kendama and making videos. Um, so from there, like Matt has just been um, supportive and allowed me to do a lot of amazing things these past 10 years. That's cool. Yeah, you've been on, on the team for nine years now, right? So Is that what you were saying? At the, so I've been playing Kanama for 12 years. At the end of November, it'll be uh, 10 years on Sweets Kanama. 10 years. So I was unsponsored for two years. Cool. Okay, uh, last question here, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, Is batch one design no more? Are we going to see the evolution uh, putting away the old design, or are we always going to have batch one, batch two, batch three going forward as consistent? You will see batch one again. I'll leave it there. Cool. Well, Christian, thank you so, so, so much for jumping on the preview this morning. It's always a privilege for me today to sit and have coffee with someone while talking about a mutual love and affection for Kanama. Uh, I think that we've learned so much. I've learned so much today, a lot about lefty playing with using right strung Kanamas, also yeah. about architecture. I think that that brings a lot of perspective, A, into just the appreciation of how things are designed, how design actually plays an effect on, on utility more than just how it looks. That yep. Even though these are stunning kendamas to look at, the design of it was integral to how it plays, which is important. Same with going on to the batch too. Like, I love that you're progressing design. I love that you're progressing how we play based on design. And so thank you for that. Is there anything you'd like to add to the, to the final notes of the conversation here before we wrap it up? Yeah, I mean, it's just a, a couple things. Like for in design, the one thing that made this work so well is form follows function. It's a very famous architect said that. And it's like things that work really well generally look really good. So there's that. And then I will say, um, well, one, thank you, of course, for having me. This was awesome. I love chatting with you. Hope to see you in person sooner than later. It'll happen will, soon, I'm sure. And I will say this to all my American friends that are 18 and older. Um, please vote on Tuesday. Uh, your voice counts. Get out there and vote because you can make a difference. Awesome. Well, thank you, Christian Frazier. And thank you to all of you guys who tuned in for the live conversation. This will also be uploaded onto Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and all your other favorite podcasting platforms that you use. So make sure that you tune in there. It really helps if you guys can give this a share, like, or leave a comment and head over to your favorite podcasting platform and follow slash download or subscribe. That really helps to get these conversations in front of more people that play Kendama. All that said, I hope you guys stay caffeinated and we'll see you next week on The Review. Thank you, guys. See you, Christian. Thanks, Adam. Peace.